Hey guys, Cal Torak here. Today I am bringing you my ultimate solo Marudon Princess Guide. It even includes a bonus kill on the Wild God's Rune Delirious Ancient, in case you want to try solo farming that as well. If you watched my first solo princess video, I have learned a lot of new tips and tricks since then, so this should make things very easy for you guys. Let's dive right in. First, why do we do this farm? Princess has many good items. Blackstone Ring is an incredible ring that you can sell. I've helped get a lot of guildies this ring, and in chat I see people selling them for hundreds of gold. The main reason we are doing this farm though is for Blade of Eternal Darkness. I have a video talking about this dagger already, so check it out. But in short, the proc on this dagger gives mages essentially infinite mana on AoE pulls, especially large pulls. For anything AoE related or boosting related, this dagger is forever bis. Seriously, I use this dagger even in TBC farms. It's that good. Unless Blizzard adds another item with this mechanic on it, you will be using this dagger when AoE farming forever. Now, this dagger has two drop rates. At the start of Classic, it has a 0.3% drop rate. Eventually though, I believe in the AQ patch, the drop rate was increased to 2%. In Season of Mastery, it was 2% from the start. Now there is a lot of speculation as to what the drop rate in Season of Discovery is, but we are seeing plenty of mages already get the dagger in the Mage Discord. This has led many of us to believe that is a 2% drop rate. We obviously don't have hard confirmation of this yet, so farm this at your own sanity. Let's talk about the Scepter of Celebrus. The Scepter is an item that opens a portal to the Waterfall in Mara. This essentially skips half of the dungeon for you, putting you at a very short two and a half minute walk from Princess. If you watched my first video, you saw me run to Princess from Purple Side. However, this is a much faster way of doing it. Pick up the quest Legends of Maradon from Kavindra outside of the orange side of Mara. This quest will have you collect two halves of the scepter. You will need a party for this. You will need to kill three bosses in Mara for this quest. You will need to kill Lord Viletung in Purple Side, Noxian on Orange Side, and Celebrus right before you jump down to the Waterfall. Make sure you loot the quest items from Viletung and Noxian. After you kill Celebrus, talk to him and use his dialogue option. You will then be able to turn in the quest. Accept the new quest and there will be some RP. You will need to loot an item off the ground. Once you do, you will be able to turn in the quest to Cerebrus, and you will have your scepter. To do the skip, run to this point out here between orange and purple entrances. You will use your scepter here and a portal will open. Right click the portal and you will appear at the waterfall. If you do not want to bother getting the scepter, watch my last video and use the route from purple side. But honestly, just get the scepter. Okay, getting the princess is easy. If you have dual spec, I recommend doing this as deep frost. This is the spec I'm using for the run. But as long as you have Ice Barrier, Ice Block, and Cold Snap, you will be fine. I have done this run to Princess as my fire spec, but it is way harder and scarier. I highly recommend Deep Frost for the run. Start by heading forward and maintain Ice Barrier and Mana Shield for the entire run. Ignore all of the Hydras at the front. Hug the left as you pass the first set of Basilisk. If you aggro them, just slow them and keep running. Head towards the rocks on the left here. This is an evade spot, so if you need to hang out here and wait for Frost Nova cooldown, or to heal up, you can. I then like to blink past these Basilisk. Do not hug the wall on the left when you blink. It can bug and you'll blink in place. Make sure to have a clear path when you blink. Jump over these corners, it will help you keep your distance. You gotta be really careful about the Basilisk being close to you. Always try and blink, Nova, or Kona Cold when they're close. Their AoE silence can really screw you up. If you get silenced, Ice Block, immediately cancel it, and try and Nova them or blink away. When you get to the first set of giants, I blink through them. 
Hug the Riot as you pass the second set, Nova the Patrol, and blink through the last set of Giants. Go right up to this rock. You can run up the left side like this. Now, you've probably had this happen to you, but sometimes these Giants refuse to reset. They will throw rocks forever and stay aggroed even though they are far away sometimes. When mobs are evading, you are able to log out while in combat. So, once you get to this rock, wait a second and then log out. You can type slash camp to do this. Once you log out, wait at your character select for 2 seconds and then log back in. The mobs will have reset because you are obviously no longer there. This will instant reset the giants, and you'll be able to start your princess run. Alright, for my kill spec, I've tried a lot of different things. Deep Arcane, Deep Frost, hybrid builds, with many rune combinations. This is what has worked best for me. This Deep Fire spec has had my fastest kill times. I've killed princess in less than 3.5 minutes, before combustion had time to reset. By far, my fastest lockouts have been with this build. I've reset in less than 8 minutes before. Arcane Concentration for clear casting. Man is a real battle here. Extra range on fire spells is huge, obviously. Cooldown and crit on fire blast are huge because we actually use them a lot. And we get a lot of hot streak procs because of fire blast crit. Spell power doesn't get much value here. So I prefer Chronostatic for emergency heals. Other runes don't have much impact. Living Bomb and Living Flame are a majority of my damage. Once I figured out the boulder throw, I got really good at making her stand in living flame for a few extra ticks. We can quickly talk about Molten Armor versus Mage Armor. If you are not having issues with mana, I recommend Molten Armor over Mage Armor. If you are having mana issues, use Mage Armor. I have been preferring Mage Armor in my current gear. I have tried different combinations of Enlightenment and Burnout. Burnout with Mage Armor, Enlightenment with Molten Armor, Enlightenment with Mage Armor. I have found that running Enlightenment always is better than running Burnout. So again, I like to currently use both Enlightenment and Mage Armor just to make sure my mana is good. Speaking of gear, this is what I'm using. I am basically full Gnomer Biss. I have over 200 spell damage unbuffed. And I am very easily able to clear her with only Mana Potion as consumes. Movement speed is required for this farm. If you do not have movement speed to Boots Enchant or the Arathi Basin move speed boots, you will not be able to do this farm. I do have a consume list to make this easier, but I have cleared her several times with limited buffs and consumes in this gear. If your gear is worse, more consumes may be required. Celestial Orb is nice for this. I've been using it every few resets to speed up clears, but again, not needed. I wouldn't recommend Irradiated for this farm, but if you are a god at avoiding boulders, maybe you can pull it off. Okay, on to consumes. Greater mana potions are basically required. I use 2-3 to three every pull. You can do it without them, but man, it's super rough on mana. I always bring greater mana pots. Swiftness potions are useful if you're struggling at getting to Princess, especially if you aren't doing it as Frost. When I do use a Swiftness potion, I prefer to use it here. For buffs, anything that gives you mana or damage. Mana oil for MP5, as well as Sagefish for food. Mighty Troll's Blood Potion actually provides a nice amount of passive health regen, so if you don't want to run Chronostatic for healing, you can get away with Mighty Troll's Blood if you're good enough. Lesser Arcane Elixir and Elixir of Firepower for extra damage. Scrolls of Spirit for the extra mana regen. Also, make sure you're making all three of your mana gems. Let's talk about weak auras and add-ons. First one I want to talk about is the Mana Ticker Weak Aura. I'll have it linked down below, as well as the other Weak Auras and add-ons I'm about to talk about. It tracks each server tick that you are going to regen mana on. Evocation gives you mana on these regen ticks. Since we are only able to channel a few seconds of evocation, you really want to min-max your time on the cast. If you cast it just after a mana tick happens, you are screwing yourself over on a lot of mana. Watch your mana ticker, and cast Evocate right before you're about to gain that mana. I am very consistently able to get 3 full ticks of mana from Evocate by timing my cast well after creating distance with Blink. Now I want to talk about the add-on Target Health. It essentially just tells me what percent the mob HP is at. If you already have something telling you this, great. 
HP percent is important because at 30% HP, mobs become staggered and move slightly slower. At 20% HP, they become extra staggered and move really slow. It's not super important, but it's nice to be able to track the HP percent so you know when they will start moving slow. I also recommend this range display add-on, as well as this Princess Boulder Weak Aura my buddy Darbs made for me. Boulder has a 30 yard range, and when abusing leeway it becomes super easy to avoid Boulder. This range checker makes it really easy to just dodge it. So let's quickly talk about leeway. Leeway is a mechanic in the game that is essentially designed for latency in 2004. Leeway is designed to essentially make hitting targets that are moving away from you easier. This applies to all players and mobs. Here's the best way I think I can visualize this for you guys, but feel free to correct me in the comments if you think this is horribly explained. Here is your normal hitbox. When you are running forward though, or a target in general is just running or strafing, their hitbox size is increased. This is leeway. This does not happen when you're backpedaling, which is why you sometimes see mages backpedaling and farming to abuse leeway. So in this scenario, I am running away from Princess. Her boulder attack has a 30 yard range. So if I'm 31 yards away from her, I should be able to avoid it, right? But since I am running away, leeway will increase the size of my hitbox. So while I am 31 yards away, the increased size of my hitbox has now extended me into the range of her spell, essentially making me 30 yards away. However, if I stop moving, leeway turns off, and my hitbox will return to the original size. So, once I stop moving, my hitbox is no longer in the range of her spell, and the boulder will miss me. You will see me doing this constantly when killing her. If I know I am going to just be barely on the edge of her boulder because of leeway, I will stop moving to disable the leeway, and then she will not be able to hit me with boulder. Sometimes when doing this, it messes with the mob AI a bit too, and she will hang there for a few seconds not knowing what to do. This maximizes your living flame damage and she isn't running out of it. Abusing leeway like this by stopping moving on the edge of the range of her cast has made my run so much cleaner. Seriously, I never take damage now. Do keep in mind that range checkers will tell you when you are at 30 yards away, but since the range of her spell is 30 yards, you will want to be 31 yards away before you stop moving. There is no way to set it to directly track 31 yards away from the mob, so just be mindful of that. See when you're 30 yards away from her, and just move a little bit extra further before you stop moving, and you should avoid the cast. A big shout out to my buddy Darbs for making this weak aura, as well as my Kaltorak weak aura pack which will be updated for Phase 3 in a week or so. For those that don't know, Darbs and I are longtime friends who two years ago started our game development journey. We started our own indie game studio called Cluck Games. We have our first game on Steam right now in early access, called Castle Warriors. It is a strategy auto-battler inspired by Warcraft and Starcraft custom games, as well as Vampire Survivors. Recruit from over 50 unique units and play as several powerful warriors to support your troops from outside the battlefield. We have a massive patch coming out at the end of this month that is essentially rebuilding the game from the ground up. If you are a fan of my content and want to go the extra mile to support me, head over to our Steam page and give the game a wishlist. I am not asking you to buy the game. I would like you guys to wait and see what our next patch offers before you pull the trigger on that. Wishlists are huge for developers on Steam though, and it's free to do. So if you have a Steam account, head over to our Castle Warriors page and give the game a wishlist. Thanks for listening to this mini ad, back to the guide. Okay, let's quickly talk about selling loot. I have not sold any loot, I've only helped guildies get the ring. I am not sure where a safe spot for non-stealth classes can stand is. If someone in the comments knows, please post below. I have my stealth classes stand here though, and I am able to master loot gear to them. Lastly, when it's time to reset, have your buyer log out in the water by the waterfall. It will teleport them to purple side when you are ready to reset. In terms of loot, you can sell the ring, it's really good. And it has a lot of demand. Not sure about the other items, but I see people selling rings all the time. Sometimes Princess only drops one blue, and will drop a BOE green as her second item. 
I've gotten some really good 46 to 49 greens. I sold a level 46 tiger necklace for 50 gold. I sold a few owl and eagle pieces for 25 gold. She also drops the ace of wilds, but those are already down to one gold on my realm. So whatever. Okay, a few things about the kite path. Gnomes, be very careful at these points here and here. You will swim when running through them. So just avoid these spots. I now kite clockwise around the room. I have found this path is way better than my old path. Gives you better turns, wider angles for keeping your distance from Princess, and lets you use these rocks to mess up her pathing and LOS the boulders. For the pull, I will pop Combustion, my tailoring helmet, and then cast Pyroblast. Once Pyro goes off, I immediately cast Fireball. I will then cast Living Flame and Fireblast. After Fireblast, I will blink to the rock and begin to kite around it. Again, gnomes swing wide to avoid the water. I like kiting around this rock because you can get her caught on it sometimes to juggle her, as well as LOS her when she casts Boulder. At this point, it's just constantly running from her, keeping up Living Bomb, and Fire Blasting her when you can. Try and save Blinks for situations where she is less than 10 yards from you, or when she is casting Boulder and you know you won't be able to leeway range her in time. Make sure to use Living Flame on cooldown. Try and use it when she's closer to you, and try and use it when you suspect a Boulder cast should be soon. Obviously it's RNG, but I would avoid casting Living Flame immediately after she casted a Boulder, since she is less likely to cast Boulder again. Obviously, anytime you get a hot streak proc, Pyroblast. For mana, you want to be really aggressive with your consumes. The moment you have spent over 1,000 mana, pop your first mana pot. The next time you have spent 1,000 mana, pop your first mana citrine. You want to get these on cooldowns as fast as possible so you can use them again in the fight. Again, when it comes to evocation, try and use it after a good long distance blink and time it with your mana ticks. Kite her in a circle like this, and when she is slowed, it's pretty much GG. If you ever need to heal because you have taken too much boulder damage, wait until you blink to avoid a boulder and immediately cast chronostatic preservation to heal yourself. You should be able to top yourself off and get your next blink off before she hits you. There's potentially a second way to kill her. You can juggle her on this small rock here. I've actually juggled her for quite some time. Problem I have here is the swimming. Since I'm a gnome, this is really hard to do. I can't go to this right side here, and that causes me to be LOS a lot because I'm too short to look over the rock. This spot may end up being better for nom gnome classes, but I'm a gnome and can't test it, so there you go. If you can master this rock juggle though, it'll be the fastest way to kill her because she will get maximum living flame damage. For the reset point, it's really easy. I don't know if everyone can swim at the top of the waterfall. Might just be a gnome thing, but I log out here, and it'll teleport me to purple side for the reset. If you can't log out up here, just swim down below, hug the edge of the waterfall, and log out. Make sure to avoid the crocodile. Once you're back on purple side, zone out, go left, and then you'll get back to the portal spot. Make sure you reset the instance before zoning in. Okay, if you want to solo the Delirious Ancient for the Wild Gods rune, it is really hard, and in my opinion, it is not worth trying to solo. It takes a long time, it's really hard, honestly, it just makes sense to do it in a group. If you want to solo it here though, this is how. The mob is super annoying because it will reset if it goes more than 10 seconds without taking damage. Living Bomb Explosions and Living Flame do not count. You are essentially required to spam Fire Blast at him the entire time. The problem with this is he moves so fast, Blink is required. Spamming Fire Blast just ooms you so fast, and since he's immune to slow, he's eventually going to catch you if you can't blink. The trick I found to killing him was using Rank 1 Fire Blast. By spamming Rank 1 Fire Blast, I found I was able to have enough mana to keep him constantly tagged while kiting him. It's really a race to get him to 30%. Once he starts moving slower because he's 30%, it's an easy kill. Just keep blinking and spamming rank 1 fire blast, and eventually he will die. Again, I do not think he is worth soloing like this, but hey, if you're crazy like me, go for it. Okay, I think that's everything for my advanced Mara guide. I will be ending this video with a full run so you can watch it. I'm sure there are a few things that can be done to clean this up, but I'm already clearing in less than 8 minutes. If you are enjoying the content I'm creating, please like and subscribe. Good luck on the grind, boys, and may Blades of Eternal Darkness be in your future.